I'm an Iraqi citizen, and I had to leave my country because of the war. As I still, I still remember every single thing that happened the few days before the war, and I was, um, I was 15, and we were at school um, the day before the war happened. We launched the invasion, um, and we have, in my opinion, uh, a tremendous responsibility to help those people. We have a culture that is, in many, many ways, in complete chaos. Arlene Flaherty is a Dominican sister who traveled to the Middle East and observed the Iraqi refugee situation firsthand. When we speak about Iraqi refugees, we're talking about two groups of people. And one group of people are those who are internally displaced. And that's a term that we use to refer to folks who are living, still living within their country, but unfortunately because of the circumstances of violence, or uh, the danger of violence, they have to either keep moving or have to have moved from their village or their town for their own security. As Arlene Flaherty explains, the second group of people are externally displaced, finding refuge in neighboring countries. Outside of Iraq, we have uh, what you might call the conventional refugee, meaning a person who has had to actually flee their country because of the fear of, of persecution or of great suffering or violence or loss of life, uh, believing that their country cannot offer them protection or safety. More than two million Iraqi people choose to leave the country because of the violence in Iraq. These people are fleeing to neighboring countries. Syria hosts more than 1.5 million Iraqi citizens, but has ended its open door policy and now has visa limitations on the Iraqi refugees. Jordan hosts about one million Iraqis who have to pay for the most basic services to survive. Egypt closed its borders to Iraqi refugees after hosting 130,000 Iraqi citizens. Turkey took in 10,000 Iraqi citizens. Lebanon is the smallest of the countries and hosts more than 50,000 Iraqis. These people live as criminals, hiding from arrest, detention, and even deportation. We have thousands, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis who have had to flee their own country because of persecution, uh, because of um, security issues, who are now living in other countries. So we have a culture that is in many, many ways in complete chaos. My name is Louis and I am uh, an Iraqi citizen from Kirkuk, from in northern Iraq. I left Iraq uh, right after wor working with the U.S. Army and the U.S. Embassy Office in my hometown because of the war. My very early experiences of the war were from the first Gulf War when I was very young. I mean, I was eight or nine years old in 1990s, beginning of 1990s, and uh, it was a very difficult time for us. My, <clears throat> my father was lost. We didn't know what happened to him. And it was only my mother and us, and we were six, and she was pregnant. And uh, where we lived in our neighborhood, it was in Kirkuk again, and it was a very, very multi-ethnic city. And there was all kinds of rumors going on. Once the bombing started, the U.S. bombing, everything, we were cut out of the world, you know. There was no electricity, no water, no food. It was the most difficult and devastating time. We were so scared because we were getting, we were alone. And there was no gas for people to travel. Like, there's no cars. You're, you're like, lucky to see a car in the street driving. So we walked from our house, we took some possessions, like essentials, and we walked, we walked from our house to the bus station to go to, to the north because it's supposedly safer, maybe, we don't know. It's all a matter of luck. And then we walked, it was like about 15 miles from our house, and all of us were kids, we walked all the way to the bus station. And there, there was so many people just trying to survive. Everybody was scared, just like we were. And the bus, before it stops, it was full of people. And then, I don't know how we managed to get into a bus, and we met another Christian family, their father was lost. And these are the first like, memories that I remember, the most intense memories. And they also stuck with us. They said, we'll stick together if we live or die together. And I remember the family had two kids, and it was the mother, two kids, and the sister-in-law. And they stayed with us till the end, actually. And um, when we found the bus, we went to Erbil in the north, and we stayed there. And 
we're just running from bombing, you know. I remember seeing the tanks behind us and I saw the first dead bodies in my life. It was a time like only the body sh should survive, your body and nothing more. And one woman was carrying her children. She had uh, two children on her shoulders and she was running with people for a long distance. And at the end, she got very tired and she threw them away to survive with her own. And this is something that I can never forget, you know, how she threw them. It was there's like a kind of hole. She threw them there and she ran away and with running with people. And I believe she loved her children, you know. And, and this is a question about love. How much can you love when, when you're in such circumstances? Uh, what is love? When we say I love my husband, my wife, my mom, and my dad, and I, I always say it this way, this story, because it's it just so touching to me. How much can we love, you know? And I'm sure this woman loved her children, but do you see what war does to people? In um, every situation of war and violence, the children are the innocent victims. We have children that ha whose lives have just been devastated. And I think as Americans, it's incumbent upon us to, to really look at those issues, separate and apart from, as I said, the war itself. But we have to look at what violence and what war does in terms of future generations of Iraqis. Iraqi refugee children are facing the crisis of having a very hard time accessing education. Their families, usually both their parents are unemployed. Sometimes Iraqi refugee children are sort of sent out to work. They might be, for example, selling gum in the streets or helping out as sort of, you know, a helper at an auto mechanic garage. Iraqi children are um, exhibiting the kind of um, behaviors and symptoms that you would associate with a child who is in stress. And uh, we heard testimony that um, you know, children are stuttering, they're having difficulty sleeping. Uh, children who are long past toilet training are beginning to have bedwetting. That uh, the fact that the ch so there are some children who are unwilling to go outside of their homes because uh, they're traumatized they remember a context of bombs or perhaps a bad scene uh, that they witnessed. And they're not so sure about the security of their new situation, uh, though temporary, you know, in a, in a country that is hosting them at present. But I do think it is a big challenge for the international community uh, to advance serious research on the conditions of the Iraqi refugee child. It's a group of refugees that I don't think have been significantly studied. We do know that their educations have been radically interrupted, both the internally displaced child and also the child that's living as a refugee in another country. And I believe the key to all this conflict, to all this war, is to educate people. I think if you want a peaceful world, it's never about wars, because we, in history we have all these wars and millions of people died. If war was an answer, then these wars would have done something all these years. I'm an Iraqi citizen, and I had to leave my country because of the war. When I was in high school, I could think of as I wanted to be a doctor, and I wanted to go to medical school, and I knew that I wanted to go to the best one, and all I did was study, study, because this meant everything for me. My family gave me a great life, but I knew by going to medical school I would have everything that I want and I knew what my future would be like. And when I finally got accepted in my school, which takes the top 240 students in the whole country, we take one national exam and according to those scores we get accepted in a college. It doesn't matter what you want, it's what you're grades can get you into. And when I was finally accepted in my school, I thought I was in heaven. I thought I couldn't wish for anything better. I have everything I wanted. I have my, I had my family and I had my great friends and I had, you know, I got into the school that I've always dreamed of going to. And even though the war was going and all that craziness, and I knew that I could be dead or hurt any minute. I still thought things were absolutely great. I had everything gonna go and according to my plan. If I die, I die, but if not, then I've got my perfect life. And through the whole time, my parents would tell me, oh, we don't want you to go to school anymore. And I told them I couldn't care less about what they wanted. I, you know, I was going to the school and no matter what, if I die, then so be it. I, I don't care anymore. I worked so hard for this and I was not gonna let it go.
And it was hard because it was my dream and I had to leave it. I went through hell to finish my first year of college and I left it without even getting my transcripts. I worked really hard for. Iraqi students deserve the chance to further their education. The Iraqi Student Project is an organization that brings Iraqi college students on full scholarship to U.S. colleges and universities. Supporting this organization is one way to help the Iraqi refugee situation. Laura Sheehan, a regional information officer of Catholic Relief Services, explains other ways Americans can relieve this crisis. Americans can do several things to help Iraqi refugees. They can donate to charities, they can talk to their congresspeople about immigration visas, and they can simply educate themselves about the situation and learn about different ways to help. Help give Iraqi citizens a brighter future. Start by visiting Catholic Relief Services at www.crs.org and Refugees International at www.refugeesinternational.org.